All right, welcome to the Simply Statistics podcast. This is number six, uh, and I'm here with Jeff Leak, and we're here to talk more about MOOCs. So, uh, yeah. Jeff, you just finished your course in data analysis on Coursera. That's so right. How'd it go? Uh, that's a good question. That's a big question. <laughs> it um, literally like just finished. Like, it's it's like finishing now. I'm about, ago, I'm about right? to yeah. send out the certificates right. and everything, so it's just finished. So it's fresh on my mind. Right. I, you know, I had a great time. I thought it went really well. I think there was. Um, uh, generally, some really positive feedback, so I hope that it went yeah. well for people. But and I think um, when all was said and done, you had like how many people uh, enrolled? Like a hundred. So there was a uh, just over a hundred thousand, like a, about a hundred and two thousand people enrolled in the class. Right. And um, uh, of that number, I would say there was between five and ten thousand that did absolutely everything. There, so so they, we're talking they, quizzes. Quizzes, watched all the videos, did all the data analysis, did the grading of the data analysis, sort of the right. entire the entire spectrum. Which, yeah. to be fair, that's I think given the sort of a, a workload that I put on the Coursera class, I'm I'm happy. I'm pretty thrilled that even right. that number got all the way through. It was yeah. pretty. I, I intentionally made the cl the level pretty hard. So, right. um, now, this, th now this class was kind of different from your kind of standard, you know, statistics class that you would teach at a you know at a university, right? Like you teach yeah. a statistics class here, right? Um, but this was kind of different, right? I mean, so there's yeah, it's a it's a little bit different because teaching a, a class in data analysis has a little bit of you know computer science, a little bit of statistics, a little bit of sort of just writing and composition, and so. <laughs> Some of those elements are easier or harder to evaluate in particular, but they're also right. easier or harder to teach. You know, it's, right. it's pretty easy to teach the formula for here's how a particular statistical method works. Right. It's a little bit harder to teach, oh, here are the 90 different ways that can go wrong in real data analyses. <laughs> yeah. And so... But it seems, yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of like, classes that might be titled data analysis, it, you, a lot of it is just like, here's statistical method, here's least squares. Right. You know, here's how you fit a regression. Just because it seems like it's easier to kind of go through that step by step, right. whereas like data analysis doesn't have as much of a step by step type of feel to it, right? I mean, right. And so I hope to. I, I think the way that we tried to capture that in the data analysis class was upfront. We did a lot about sort of organizing a data analysis and and how do you write a data analysis and how do you structure the files that you're going to use in the analysis and right. sort of things like that. And then we kind of started with data cleaning. But I think the my impression is the place that people learned the most about how to do real data analysis was on the message boards. Okay. You know, I mean, yeah. there's only so much I can talk about in, you know, 50 videos or whatever. Right. And there's only so much that I can do in a few quizzes and a couple of data analyses. But, right. you know, people would post their ideas about data analysis. They would post things that went wrong. And then they'd have these really kind of interesting, in-depth discussions about them. I think that's maybe the biggest advantage of the platform was yeah. people could talk to each other. <laughs> and that's, Put people up with each other, yeah. It feels like, I mean, for a classic data analysis, it's a lot about just getting experience and seeing things that could go wrong. And yeah. I felt like the best place for that was on the message board. So yeah. I think that's where, for a classic data analysis, that was a huge advantage, I think. Yeah. So um, on the other hand, there was I think that that led to huge heterogeneity, both <laughs> in the number of people that, you know, the kind of people that took the class, um, in terms of their skills and abilities and interests, right. you know, and uh, that, pre pre you know, presented some challenges that <laughs> I don't run into well, around now, here. Right? But the so, message board was, by and large, civilized, right? I mean, it wasn't out of hand. Yeah, so. I think so. I think there was definitely, you know, I think it's like any message board <laughs> anywhere, right? There's, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there's the 1% that are really rude and the 1% that are really, really helpful. And then there's most people are, right. you know, Pretty helpful and want to help each other and talk about it and everything like that. So the majority of people are civilized. So as far as like funny. internet message board standard was like above average, below average. I don't know. I think it was right definitely average. above average okay. quality of interaction with right. with people. Although I think there definitely were, you know, ways in which I think that um, I don't know if Coursera could encourage this or if the class could encourage it. But I I think there's definitely a little bit of that internet message board mentality right. to maybe unavoidable. Yeah. I think it's a little bit unavoidable, but I know that it was. It presented frustrations for me as an instructor in that once you get a certain volume of noise in the message board, it's hard to sift out like and point to this is a great discussion. Everybody right. should go look at that. Right. When there's you know a lot of discussion and some of it is less helpful and and, and some of it is really helpful. It's hard right. to like filter that noise. Yeah. Out. So, yeah. but I don't think I think that some of that is just unavoidable in yeah. terms of. <laughs> yeah. that magnitude of a class that's that's just what's going to happen so. so I remember when you were planning the course you know the biggest challenge was like how do you grade a data analysis right like, yeah how do you know if this how do you say this is a good data analysis how do you say this is a not so good data analysis right, right. so 
How did that all work out? <laughs> yeah, so I think we knew in advance, or at least I knew in advance, that this was... So we do something similar to what we did in class, you know, locally here when we teach the class here, a, a data analysis class. Um, we have kind of a rubric that people follow. And mm -hmm. here we can be a little bit loose with the rubric because right. there's only a few people and people can quickly ask questions and we can update the rubric right. without sort of <laughs> propagating that to, you know, 20,000 people right. immediately, right? So... Right. Um, at, at scale, you kind of have to fix, it felt like you had to fix a rubric and go with it because right. every time you edit that, there's a whole host of questions that go with why did you change this, you know, question right. from and this just, to that. And just to be clear, so you use peer review. You use peer oh, review. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. taking a step back, there was no way I was going to actually physically grade, you right. know, 10,000 data analyses. It right. takes forever to grade these because there's a lot to think about. Um, so we did peer grading. And it, think, did, it didn't seem possible to have to like automatically grade them in terms of like have writing a computer program to automatically grade them. Right. I think right. that would be really hard, especially because the data analyses, I tried to do one uh, data analysis that was sort of inference, statistical inference focused, right. and one that was prediction focused. Right. And in both cases, a, a huge component of the grade has to be, you know, were they able to cogently describe what they'd done and right. were they able to sort of, you know, explain in, in plain language what this estimator meant and all that sort of thing. That's pretty hard. I think that would be pretty hard to write a, a program. To do. That's a heavy-duty natural language <laughs> processing to be right. able to figure out what's going on from this. So, so I felt like peer review was really the only option for a class like this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I thought, I knew that there was going to be some trouble with that at the level of, you know, one rubric doesn't really fit all, and and, and it's going to be unevenly applied because right. not everybody knows, you know, how to grade. You know, not everybody knows how to do a data analysis, right. so clearly not everybody's going to know how to grade a yeah. data analysis. I bet if you polled like fifty PhD level statisticians about, you know, what makes oh, yeah. a good stat, what makes a good data analysis, you get a pretty big wide range. Yeah, and and we know. <laughs> I mean, I've observed that. You know, here if I grade papers and then have another faculty member grade papers, right. and we don't always get the exact same answer. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. not even, sometimes it's not even close, and so I think. There, that was inevitable. So the Coursera allows you to average over a, a bunch of grades. Right, you know, it yeah. takes the median of four or five scores, right. which I think ameliorates some of that problem. But um, realistically, we got our ambulance here. <laughs> we, and medical uh, campus. It's like you know, we could never record anything without an ambulance. I know it's, it's like, like the ambiance <laughs> of a Simply Statistics podcast. <laughs> That's right. So uh, yeah. So I guess the thing I was saying is, is that uh, you've got this rubric that you're going to give to people and and. You know that there's going to be heterogeneity in the way it's applied, but you got to kind of pick something to go with. And the one thing that I think, so there's a platform issue in terms of you can't weight the scores. It's it's relatively hard to weight different components. Oh, of the rubric. Of the rubric. Right, okay. um, and so that made it a challenge because, you know, there are different things you'd like to weight differently. Right, You know, yeah. so it's, it's so I think that's a, an update that I'm sure Coursera could implement easily and would yeah. really help with the this kind of rubric. Yeah. There's also a lot of feedback that I got in terms of which parts of the rubric were sort of useful and which ones weren't. Uh -huh. Some of that feedback, a lot of that feedback was conflicting in right. that I would get an email from one person that said, I hated item three in right. the rubric, and then somebody would also email me the next day and say, you know, everything was terrible except item three in the right. rubric. And I, so, I find all feedback is conflicting, right? I know. Right? So I'm, I'm trying to synthesize that, but there's another sort of hard problem is synthesizing a, a very yeah. large number of... Uh, of well, I guess of, one question is, do you think the rubric produced variability, you know, across... I mean... It, I mean, a, rub a bad rubric would be one that, like, everyone gets the same score, right? I mean, or so it doesn't seem to separate out. So it's pretty clear, like, if you look at the distribution of scores, that there's a huge, you know, there's a big variability in the in the scores that people got. Okay. So there is, I think it's a rubric that separates people. Now, okay. the question is, does that rubric separate people to the cream right. of the crop at the top and the <laughs> right. people that didn't do quite so well at the bottom? Yeah. And so some people posted sort of their, their final scores and their data analyses, and I think my impression, sort of gut feeling, is the score that they got reflected what I would, you know, in very After sort of reviewing. broad strokes terms, yeah. would have sort of given them yeah. as a, as a score. So, so there was now there was one element of the rubric that got nixed, right? So the reproducibility yeah. element, right? So, so this was a that was heartbreaking for me because yeah. I really, you know, I, we're both pretty big fans <laughs> of reproducibility, right. and so I really wanted to have that be part of the rubric. You turn in so your code, it, yeah. So like one of the items was like, is the analysis reproducible or something like that? Right. right, so I, we talked a lot about how do you make an analysis reproducible in terms of writing code that produces the same outputs and, and sort of matches, tracks the numbers that appear in your final report. Yeah. And so originally I had people submitting this R code, 
And, and actually, it was somebody on the, on the discussion forums that pointed out to me that the, the, the potential danger for that, right? Because you right. can send system commands with R. Yeah. And so yeah. <laughs> uh, it's almost 100% sure that the, you know, the vast, vast majority of people on Corsair are benign and wouldn't right. do something like that. But right. if there's, you know, at that kind of scale... If there's one out of 40,000 people who would just, you know, even that, inadvertently... Do that, like you know, delete your home directory. <laughs> exactly, right. that's not gonna. I had these nightmares. I, you know, the <laughs> night before when I was thinking about this, I started thinking about, you know, I was having nightmares that I was gonna get sued because right. I had just, you know, somebody by running somebody else's R code had like destroyed their computer. Right. That was the <laughs> yeah. end of, that was the end of my career on Coursera. So, right. I, I ended up just nixing it entirely. And there were some suggestions about ways to fix that, sort of in terms of sandboxing or, or using right. R Studio or Amazon to sort of build machine images that people could run the code on that were right. sort of. Um, in some way protected people when yeah. they're running the code. I think, I couldn't think of a solution that was uh, uh, applicable given the heterogeneity of skill. Right. Yeah, I mean, so you think like telling someone to just log into Amazon. Or so, uh, right, know, so for me, and, you know, for somebody yeah. who's got a little bit of facility with this, yeah. it wouldn't be, you know, that hard to say, how about you just log into this AMI and, right. and run the code? And I, I could do that. It would take a little work, but you right. could do it with some instructions. Right. But I feel like that would definitely narrow the pool of people that could do it, you know, yeah. could, do, could evaluate. And it seems like, I mean, although it would, it would allow for kind of t testing reproducibility, I mean, I would argue maybe logging into Amazon's cloud is not one of the fundamental skills of data analysis, right? Absolutely like, You know, not. it's like yeah, it's somewhere yeah. on the list maybe, but maybe not at the top. And it's requiring people to be able to do that it seems like a bit... Yeah, and so maybe if our studio had some kind of, or so one of these other sort of organizations, revolutions, or somebody had like a, a, a version of R where I could, you know, you could uh, imagine creating sort of a sandbox directory where the data were stored right. and that people could access and run the code. Yeah. That That's possible, but then you're relying on somebody to, to right. build that, which I don't think that infrastructure exists yeah. in, in a way that's... Yeah, accessible I mean, by 100,000 people. On the one right hand, now. The, I mean, the, the exercises for the class are not like super heavy duty. Right. But there are like maybe 20,000 people who are going to be running them at as, perhaps the And same it's going to be very similar. You know, the window yeah. is pretty narrow for the grading. And so right. you could run right. into troubles on that level. But also, just um, I think that it's not clear to me that, well, Taking another step back, it's not clear to me that that even proves reproducibility on some level. There's there's a component of reproducibility in that, you know, some people were using Macs, some people were using PCs, and all sorts of stuff. Right. So, yeah. uh, is it reproducible if I have to have this machine set up in advance for you to, before you start right. creating code? Right. So there's yeah. a difference between reproducibility sort of in the wild and right. what we would the reproducibility we'd be yeah. setting up with this, right? Which is some kind of training wheels reproducibility where we've set up the environment for them right. and we've set up the sort of the version of R and the versions of the packages and the versions of the data. Right, yeah. Where in reality, in sort of the, in the wild when you're doing data analysis, that's not all going to be set up for you in advance. And so right. you have to think about some bigger issues. So yeah. um, I'd really like that to be, you know, I'm, like I said, I just finished the class, right. so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure when I'm going to run it again, but it, when and if I run it again, I definitely think that um, I want to make that part of the class, and so I think that's going to have yeah. to be, uh, there's going to have to be a lot more forethought that goes into that than I realized, though, and I think, right. but. Um, and then, so just to, the last thing is, in terms of, like, you had a, you had a pretty wide range of students. I mean, I, I had, like, you know, 50,000 students right. in my computing for data analysis, and uh, but it was kind of a... I mean, it was a narrower theme. It wasn't like we're teaching you data now. This right. is more like you're, you're, we're going to teach how to program in R. And so right. I think the heterogeneity maybe was somewhat less. I mean, yeah. Um, but like, I so for data analysis, I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, what was the heterogeneity like? I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. I, I, I think that was from the message boards. It became clear basically from the first day yeah. how insane the heterogeneity was right. going to be. And yeah. I know I've been approached by professors in our department, but other places as well. These are, you know, the top PhDs in statistics were watching the videos and participating. Right. There was also people that really had trouble, just struggled to install R in, right. on their computer. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, yeah. when you've got that broader range... I they weren't like, the same people? They were, well, <laughs> they might have been the same people. I'm not going to, I won't name names. Yeah. But, you know, even, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, now I'm in dangerous territory. But I guess I would say that, you know, given that heterogeneity, it's very hard to target a class like this, you know, and, and so I think that was part of the reason why we didn't have, you know, why it was a relatively small proportion that finished is right. because you just have such a broad variety. Those 5,000 were the people in the window of right. skills that this was useful for them, right. but not boring, you right. know, so... So, I mean, given what you've seen and what you went through, do you have any thoughts on, like, how you could do this class again, but manage to kind of, in some sense, satisfy the whole wide range of students? I mean, I... I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, there's... 
Uh, one thing that would definitely be possible, I think, would take more support. So, so this class, I ran pretty much exclusively. I mean, I had help from the tech people here for sort of tech support type issues, right. and the Coursera people for mostly tech support type issues. But I didn't have, and we had community TAs who would answer a few questions. But in right. terms of setting up quizzes or generating content for quizzes or generating new, you know, slides and all that, we, you know, we did all that ourselves. Right. Yeah. If I had more resources, I would really strongly consider having multiple levels of data analysis. You mm -hmm. get to pick your level in advance. Some, you know, you could be the bigger, in intermediate, or advanced data analysis that you choose to do. And I would yeah. do the same thing with the quizzes. Yeah, I think that's the way. One way that you could, you know, d let people to sort of try it at different levels. Right. I mean, the other option is offering different classes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I that's basically what uh, we do here. Which is what we do here, and yeah. I think it what's done in a lot of places, but I think one advantage of this platform in particular is you could imagine a scenario where you have sort of basic lecture content. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of people on the message boards talking about these issues at all different levels. Right. And then you just offer you know quizzes and tests at different levels and give different certificates depending right. on what you accomplished, I think, right? I think, so, there's a huge I think it's, there's an advantage to having the kind of beginner people at least see what the advanced people are talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. And similarly, I think it's, I mean, if the beginner people are up for it, I mean, it's a good for the kind of advanced people, so to speak, to see the questions of the beginners. Because, right. the, you know, the beginners ask questions without any sort of pretense, you know, or any kind of preconceived notion. I just say some of the best, And a lot of those yeah. questions are super interesting. A lot of those questions end up being questions that spawn huge discussions. Right. You know, it'd be yeah. some really, yeah. you'd think, yeah. you know, it seemed almost too basic to ask, and then they'd ask it, and then you'd see, you know, hundreds of comments as people sort right. of discuss this issue and yeah. act it out. You know, the reproducibility thing is right. kind of like that, right? Yeah. People said, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to run all this R code on my computer, and then all of a sudden there's a discussion about security, and there's a discussion, right. you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I don't know if the person originally asking the question wanted to have anything to do right. with that. They got more they than certainly got there more than they bargained yeah. for. So. But I do like the idea of mixing the levels of right. people within it. But then allowing people to kind of Show their, their skill at a different skill. level. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I would do that, but certainly that would require more support in terms of uh, just people to generate content, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's doing even, even the level that we did here, I think was a non-trivial operation to get these quizzes and data analyses sort of set up and get the right data sets and right. all that kind of stuff. And so if you were going to target it, you would really need like, I think a brain trust of people thinking about right. how to target, right? right? Yeah. How to target a data analysis is definitely an unsolved problem. Right. So yeah. <laughs> how do you know what's easy and what's hard? Most yeah. of the time you have to just do it to right. make it, you know, to decide whether it's easy or hard. So, yeah. um, yeah. So I think that that's that's certainly something I want to think about in the future, but yeah. I don't know if there's a solution right now. So. All right, well, thanks for joining us for this podcast. Uh, if you have any thoughts about MOOCs or about teaching data analysis, leave a comment on the blog. All right, thanks a lot. You know, it turns out I never I never had to do the whole like clapping thing. You didn't have to do no, that? No, because you just like put it in Final Cut and it just like syncs the whole thing for you. Oh, it figures it out. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, <laughs> just like, please.